Kia kato, no mai, hari mai, greetings and welcome to this month's EHF live session. Edmund Hillary Fellowship is a collective of entrepreneurs, scientists, storytellers, creatives and investment change makers who want to make an impact globally from Aotearoa. These are informal sessions and they're planned in a way that when you leave here after 60 minutes, you feel you know the fellows on a personal level and understand what their intentions are for New Zealand. In this session, you're going to hear from Grant Silt, an EHF fellow, as he aims to connect fellows, Hano, and the New Zealand ecosystem that share the qualities of purpose-led investment and effort in ecological regeneration. He'll share case studies and more with us. So I'm going to hand it over to Grant now, and he will um, take us through a cool presentation, and then we will do some Q&A. So about 45 minutes of a prezo, and then 15 minutes for Q&A. Thanks, Grant. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm going to jump into our complicated screen share arrangement here. <laughs> How are we doing there? Everyone has my screen? Yes, I can Wonderful. see the screen. Wonderful. <clears throat> um, today, I want to share um, stories of stewardship in investment in regeneration, in regenerative agriculture, in ecotech, in ag tech, in clean tech, and just things I've been interested in for a very long time. And I wanna share, I guess, the stories of fellows that I've uncovered along the way, but with having little, little time to, to connect and not being present in New Zealand quite yet with the, the latest cohorts, I was hoping that this would be a an entree into those sorts of connections and conversations. And if we have those in the breakout session or if we have those in future Slack convos, I'm, I'm really excited to, to engage in that conversation. Um, this first piece of art was a mosaic by a Ukrainian artist on a building where I used to live. And it was from the early nineties and it was a Ukrainian artist. And it was so wonderful at absorbing the complexity and diversity and wonder of nature for me that it's always held a place in my heart even after I, I left the area and I wanted to share it with those that, that might appreciate it on the way in. Um, and I also want to take this presentation to be a pretty uh, high-end overall um, elevated space edge view of, of things and thinking about New Zealand as a diverse ecosystem and one that has a lot of exportable uh, industry and I don't know, viewpoints to share with the world um, just because of the diversity of, the, of that ecosystem and how it can really relate to so many parts of the world around the, around the globe. Um, my purpose for this presentation is to spark discussion, camaraderie and collaboration amidst fellows, um, share with the broader network outside of EHF in New Zealand and I'll make some humble suggestions for what I think my contributions and what others could be uh, towards New Zealand and towards EHF. Um, I'll share my, my background and prior ventures I've done. And I wanna make this as inclusive as possible. So though I may touch on a few fellows in the slideshow, I wanna invite other fellows to join in and speak up about what they're doing in the ecotech and ag tech space. And uh, overall, I'm just glad you're here and I look forward to following up in the future. Uh, my email is organicgrant at gmail. I'm not afraid to share that broadly on the web. And if you want to email organicgrant at gmail, you'll connect with me directly. Um, over the last year, year and a half, two years during these COVID times when we've been locked in our homes and, and thinking and introspecting, I really took a lot of time to rethink what I thought of value creation and look beyond just fiscal value creation and what the other elements of that are uh, in the world writ large. And um, you may have heard the government of Bhutan was, is known for promoting uh, gross domestic happiness beyond just gross domestic product and other stories about that. Um, I wanna look at this from a holistic lens of value creation more than just fiscal returns and financial returns, but what are we doing for our quality of life on the whole? And I want to invite everyone to share what their viewpoint is personally of what quality of life entails to them. What are the elements, what are the metrics that you think 
deliver you satisfaction and happiness in the world. And that's really what I'm focused on you know, into the future for any entrepreneurial enterprise that I engage in. During this uh, period of introspection, I, I, I looked back and I reflected on what are my, my core strengths and skills and interested in the world. And uh, you know, here they are, putting this presentation together really made me put it on paper. Um, the last 20 years of my life has been consumed by these five things. Um, that's uh, a look at holistic ecology, at ecology and all the systems that interact in the world. Um, it's more than just a singular metric of, of carbon. Um, there's water cycles and nitrogen cycles and everything else happening. My collegiate experience and interest was around uh, resources and biomaterial science, um, agricultural byproducts, and how they integrate with engineering and the engineering world. Um, my skills in fabrication and rapid prototyping are reasonably deep, and it's something I enjoy both in launching new enterprises, but also as a hobby. Um, I have an expanding interest in the juncture of consciousness and culture forging, how our deep dives into our own psyches um, unfold into how we engage with our friends and neighbors and societies and how we change that over time. And the core theme of, of everything I've done over the last 20 years has been some semblance of agriculture and regenerative agriculture. How can agriculture be done better in a different way moving forward? When I went off to college as a naive young teen off the prairies of Iowa in the fall of 1999, I had a a deep realization within a few weeks time. Um, if you look at this image on the left here, um, I grew up in one of the green dots in one of the, the forested areas along the Mississippi River in Iowa in the middle of the US. And it was a pretty idyllic place to grow up. Um, it was one of the, it's the second longest river in the United States. It's quite the riverine ecosystem. Um, but I was in the woods and I had unlimited access to nature and we foraged and we ate well and we learned about the environment that we grew up in. And when I got to university, I realized that most people didn't have that growing up. I mean, it was largely either deeply rural um, and the Iowa ecosystem of deeply rural was monocultural crop production or an urban environment that really never got out into nature. So I realized I had a very unique perspective. And the the curriculum that I was being exposed to, that of industrial agriculture, I really did not vibe with. I saw it as so utterly destructive, and it was not the agriculture that I knew of in my bio. And I put, I found myself at loggerheads with the curriculum of instruction. Uh, most of the professors I was, uh, you know, supposed to be learning from were teaching me methodologies that I didn't agree with, and it was a big, you know, a uh, a come to Jesus moment, as they say, um, of having to reconcile what you're being told with what you believe. And one of the biggest themes there was that industrial agriculture, as it was being promoted and presented in, in, my, in my university, was a conscious and deliberate reduction in biodiversity. It was attempting to annihilate the ecosystem that was there. And the Iowa is the most altered ecosystem on planet Earth. 98% of the original land cover has been destroyed and converted to row crop agriculture. It's next to Ukraine, probably the most altered land area on planet Earth. And that's, it was 13 and a half million hectares or uh, about 30-ish, 35 million-ish acres. It's a huge area that's been altered. And I, I saw this biodiversity change as I went from my wonderful little forest ecosystem growing up into the state writ large where it was a, a major change in land use. And I had two narratives being told to me in the academic environment. One was that the only way to, to conduct agriculture was in destroying nature and planting largely one of two crops, corn or soybeans. Um, and the alternative, the more, uh, you know, the, the vegan environmentalist types also believe that corn and soy were the saviors of our food system. Uh, 
which also is not not true in my opinion, because I saw the ecological damage that was coming from the result of the production of those foodstuffs. You know, you're not saving uh, a cow by eating tofu when the tofu is destroying the habitat of so many life forms. And that was a really difficult thing for me to reconcile was that neither narrative I agreed with. And I went into a sort of, uh, not really a depression, but deep, deep introspection. And I retreated to the, the basement of the library at the university. And I was in the special collections um, area, which is like the basement, the really old books, the hundred year old books. And I was reading a book about timber framing, trying to just attach myself or understand something tactile and real, um, you know, a, a good quality building that could last and last in, an, in what I saw as a really fake environment. And I uncovered a uh, permaculture designer's manual which is written by Bill Mollison and David Holmgren, two well-known Australians. And my faith in humanity was restored. And I was able to look at all these Da Vinci-like drawings of, of functional ecosystems and buildings and, and livestock and vegetable crops that were growing in harmony. And I was like, oh, oh, okay, this is good. And when I shared this with my university professors, it was, it was mocked. And it was seen as a, a pipe dream and, and unattainable. And I realized that I had a major opportunity in life where I could integrate the concepts of synergistic design and, and holistic fruit production via the principles of permaculture and put them into more broad acre agricultural production systems. And that's what my life has been, you know, really since. And shout out to Koanga and, and all those folks carrying on uh, Mollison's dream in, in New Zealand. I've been looking up to them for many years and I'm excited to have them as cohorts in the HF. Um, so to summarize my, my ideas and my feelings, I, I, I grew up in an environment that was probably more in the past of, of a, a hunting, gathering, foraging lifestyle. And my present assessment of it was, was that it was relying on, on hydrocarbons and mining and destruction of habitat and also seeing the element of health in that people used to derive their health from what they ate and they sought medicine from their landscape. And the pharma exposure in a university environment was, it made, it just made me realize how many people were using um, drugs recreationally or prescribed that were not really great for their well being. And my father was a pharmacist, mind you. He grew up on a farm, but he was a pharmacist. And I, We'd read the Merck manual as a 10 year old just for the heck of it. And I didn't realize the extent of it of, we have access to more drugs than ever and our health has been declining in the Western world in the last 50 years. It's kind of a, it was a weird conundrum to me. It was another conundrum. So I started envisioning what would the future look like, you know, if I could design a utopia in my mind and what were the elements that were good about the present and what are the elements that should be avoided about the present? And I just created a construct of it in my mind. And, and that's kind of how I would illustrate it there on the right. Um, I saw the, the you know, industrial seed oils as one example that didn't exist historically. And I saw high rates of obesity amongst what should be otherwise healthy 20 to 25 year olds in the university system. And it's, you know, industrial seed oils are a big part of that in activities, another large part of that. Um, omega-6 to omega-3 ratios, and the vegetarian veganic argument was also not playing out to be what it was promised to be, and I know that can be a polarizing viewpoint. Um, so in the future, I see more regenerative agriculture as grazing livestock on real land, utilizing technology to make it happen. I see more perennial foodstuffs and fruits and vegetables that are in season and a high antioxidant quality and high micronutrient quality grown in real soil, uh, not in a lab, not in plastic trays with, you know, mined uh, nutrients. I think that perennial nut crops for all of their carbohydrates, proteins, and fats will become more and more common, replacing a lot of the tillage-based uh, grains and pulses and legumes that we're relying on. And I think that science is going to take another look at uh, the fungi and plants and animals that have benefited humanity for a very long time. Uh, with a critical eye. And 75% of the, the common pharmacopoeia is really plant and fungi based. Um, moving on, I suppose. 
No, that was the clapping on on. <laughs> that was like, yeah, fun guy. <laughs> uh, my uh, my second home out of out of college, I I thought I was getting a really good deal on a, a kind of a bombed out old mansion. It was about four thousand square feet, um, tile roof, very large house. And then when winter came around, this is a cold climate that I was living in. That's that was the lows that we'd get in wintertime is 20 below Fahrenheit, uh, 29 below Celsius in the wintertime. And my my January heating bill was twice what my mortgage was. And I was like, oh boy, this is expensive. What am I gonna do here? This house is huge. Uh-oh. And I went down the rabbit hole of you know inexpensive fuel sources and with access to having a wood stove, you know, you can heat your house with wood, but you're basically tending it all day long. And that's its own expense. It's just time spent in front of the wood stove. And I started looking into alternative feedstocks for heating and heating fuels. And I, I found a kind of a, a crazy eccentric inventor that had developed a wood pellet fired automated uh, boiler. And he was a terrible marketer and the aesthetics of the product were not great, but we collaborated to make it uh, a functional, effective, saleable system. And we named the company Nature Heat and developed a biomass boiler that could burn any woody, wood any woody feedstock, um, everything from local black walnuts that were falling out of the trees to cracked hazelnut shells to pelletized fuel of any sort, whether it was agricultural uh, byproducts or you know, sawdust pelletized, and sold the company within a year. And that was my first entree into entrepreneurship was that I was solving a need. I couldn't afford to pay my heating bill anymore. And we found a way to utilize inexpensive fuels and feedstocks. Uh, a few years later, you know, I grew up in the, in the 90s elsewhere in the state that I was living in. And we had curbside recycling everywhere. It was a given. Of course you had it. Of course you recycled. And in the town that I was living in, we did not have curbside recycling pickup. And there's a bit of a moral dilemma there where you could take it to the transfer station, but you have to drive it there yourself. And it, would, it took effort and it took time and that was money. And the city and the municipality refused to offer curbside recycling pickup. So with some neighbors of mine, we created a web-based portal and a private recycling service where any citizen that felt the moral imperative to recycle could pay to get their, their recyclables picked up. Um, we had easy sign up, we had a really slick logistics system, and we sold that company as well within six months to another operator in the area because our intention was not to become garbage men or, or you know, owning a recycling company. It was to scratch the itch of how do we get our recyclables consciously cared for and not have to deal with them anymore um, and felt really good about that enterprise. And we ended up open sourcing this you know, website and the, the tools that we had to let other operators do the same. Uh, a few years later, in the post 2000.com bust that occurred in the US and probably worldwide, a lot of people were putting their capital out of equities, out of stocks, and into land and into real estate, into more stable investments. And land prices uh, increased dramatically during this decade of time, probably around the world, but especially where I was. And the rental rates were not keeping pace with. What the property values were. Capital rates were being severely depressed. And I saw it as an inequitable system in that landowners weren't getting fair rents and they didn't even know it because there was no efficient price discovery system at all. So we developed what is effectively a, an Airbnb plus bidding platform for agricultural real estate, uh, probably 15 years too early. And the weakness of this, the, the Product was great. It was very solid, worked really well. The weakness was, was that the ownership class of, of land was in their 60s and 70s and it always is, at least in the US. And they weren't online yet. So you had plenty of demand side of operators, but not enough supply side of landowners and managers. And this company was sold to the second largest farm management company in the US. And they immediately killed it upon acquiring it because it was perfected. It was, it was, um, it could have cannibalized their own business. It was, you know, they had really good 
management rates for their traditional land management companies. And anyway, uh, now there's several operators doing this in the US, you know, 15 years later, doing it successfully. It was just too darn early. And it was a good lesson. Um, since then, I went on to have my own farm and put together and deploy a lot of these ideas and technologies that have been developed over the years. Um, learned a lot, developed some really cool things and realized at some point uh, that my talents were best deployed helping others do the same thing. I realized that my impact on 145 acres was great, but it's not my biggest contribution to planet Earth. It's how can I facilitate this in more places for more people and moved on from there. Okay, enough about me. I wanna talk about, uh, I'm gonna get going a little bit faster here too. I feel like I'm dragging slowly. Uh, more of the themes for how I think EHF and the New Zealand ecosystem can aid in ecotech and ag tech around the world. And first and foremost, it's thinking about ecology as a holistic system, not just a singular metric of carbon or atmospheric carbon. There's so much more to planet Earth. And I think when we're so removed from natural systems and from rural living or being in the wild, we forget how complex planet Earth is and all the things there is at, at, at play. I'll begin with focusing in on water and everything that entails. Um, human beings are 60% water. And one device that I've deployed in, in my life is whenever I meet someone new, whether I have a positive experience or a negative experience with them, I realize that they are at least 60% the exact same as me. And we have that commonality so deep in us. So it's, it's a great way to think about empathy and compassion and, I don't know, patience when I interact with, with humans around the world. Um, this next slide is uh, Iraq pre-1980. There was a, a pretty extensive lacustrine society of harvesting um, reeds and literally living in floating ecosystems. And Saddam drained this ecosystem and this society um, prior to the Gulf War. His motivations are still unknown to me, but it was such a utopic existence that I can look back on and be inspired by um, that it makes me think of what, what another future might look in a, a water world scenario. <clears throat> and, you know, the difference between this existence and, and this one is simply one of cultural standards. I mean, how porous is the ethic of social accountability? Um, point source pollutants are obviously considered to be uh, known emitters, you know, a, a, a factory that's dumping pollutants out of a pipe or a smokestack. And non-point sources, things like air pollution or you know water pollution like this. And the reality is, is that there is no such thing as non-point pollution. It's all point source that just gets a total lack of ownership or accountability. It's, it becomes an aggregate source of pollutant. And I really want to foster ethics that eliminate the idea of non-point source pollution, you know, that everyone is accountable. And how do we engage and expand upon that? Obviously the definitions of that are a bit of a farce in my opinion. Um, to share how pumped I am to be a part of EHF um, between planet and space base um, and this elements of being accountable for the entire planet earth and giving imagery and accountability for that via satellite imagery, via UAVs and, and, and drone imagery is one of the most exciting things I can think of in 20 years, and I'm excited to see how those are used to deploy um, ecotech and ag tech technologies into the future. Uh, it's also, uh, I guess, appropriate to congratulate Planet on their successful SPAC, which I think happened today officially, and their conversion to a B Corp, which is two major undertakings, and I'm, I'm really pumped about that and being amidst wonderful people like that. Uh, to continue this water story, this is Chicago on St. Patrick's Day. Every year, uh, they release a fluorescent dye into the Chicago River to dye it green to celebrate uh, the Irish 
history of that town, which is pretty crazy uh, from an environmental perspective. And it's been happening every year since 1962. This is the expression of an environmental ethic. Uh, contrary to that, in Baltimore, Maryland, in the United States, every single day, year round, this little thing named Mr. Trash Wheel collects riverine trash that floats on the river leaving town. And it keeps it out of the harbor um, and out of the Atlantic Ocean. And it's a pretty amazing technology in my opinion. Uh, the design is a simple skimmer net attached to a water wheel. It's largely passive powered. Um, when the river's flowing, it turns the water wheel just like an old steamship, which moves the uh, uh, collection elevator picking up the trash. When there's not enough river flow, uh, solar panels on it pump water, which then turns the river wheel. A uh, phenomenal example of passive technology that's appropriate and, and successful. Um, one great use case of satellite technology or UAV technology is the accountability. This is post uh, a rainstorm and seeing the amount of flotsam going into this trash wheel that otherwise would be out in the ecosystem and in the Atlantic Ocean. They've done a phenomenal job of making it, uh, in my opinion, a multi-effect enterprise where it's become a cultural phenomenon where because of the design was so goofy and lovable, but also being functional, um, it's become an exciting thing for kids to learn from. So you're eliminating that point source pollution, the actual origin of that trash being emitted by educating the children or adults for that matter that are aware of it because of it's so kitschy and weird but it's also an end of pipe intervention on its own by its function, by collecting that trash and, and removing it from, from that waterway. Uh, it became so well known and, and loved that uh, they expanded and they started building more and more of them and moving them on and they kept it funky and they have design contests for naming the next one. It's evolved a pretty interesting ecosystem where uh, it was known for collecting a, a ball python that had been released in the wild one time. And since then, they came out with uh, Lost Python Ale, a beer in, the, in Baltimore. And there's t-shirts that feel the churn and there's pins and there's uh, you know, so many elements of it that keep it in the cultural zeitgeist that it doesn't get forgotten and, and it stays engaging, which is pretty incredible. Uh, just in Baltimore, it's grown to four machines, all with their unique names. And they're staying engaged in the public eye with social media, uh, with weird names and being culturally and seasonally relevant. And again, it's, it's solving so many problems at once, not only uh, educating to eliminate point source pollution, but collecting the end of pipe uh, you know, effluent coming out of it, but also eliminating it from becoming uh, endemic in the microplastics that exist had it bypassed the end of pipe and getting in the oceans and, and being an onward thing. Um, other firms are obviously collecting in the ocean and you know, using satellite technology to find where the big trash islands are to get them out of, out of the water. Um, and yeah, let me catch up here. Um, <clears throat> Cohort three, uh, Vanessa with Oceanworks is, has a marketplace for reselling the, a lot of the collected ocean plastics, which I think is exciting and interesting that once you collect these things, how do you add value to those plastics and those feedstuffs? Um, other firms are, are doing similar. And I think it's interesting when I started this presentation thinking about different forms of capital and you know, where is value actually created with an enterprise like this, to look at all the elements of value creation is interesting to me because it's a deployment of appropriate technology. So it's accessible. It's geographically scalable. There's riverine environments and rivers all over planet earth. So you can deploy a similar idea elsewhere. Uh, they play it transparent and visible with the public eye. So, you know, it's not like it's a secret. People know what's happening and they can see it and they appreciate it. It's low enough threshold of entry that it can be locally adaptable. I think that the ideas of patents that eliminate competition or government bureaucracy can eliminate some, some of these ideas sometimes. Uh, and it, it's accessible all around and I really appreciate it. Um, if you think about the externalized costs, just like a smokestack of, oh, the, you know, a power plant's not accountable for mercury poisoning in a baby a thousand miles away. Um, I think that in time, 
you might see a bounty program or a subsidy or a premium for specifically plastic that is removed from waterborne environments because it is eliminating microplastics and foodstuffs and the long, long tail uh, health effects of that, which we'll see over time. Anyway, once we get that plastic, what do we do with it? We make creative things. Um, if you remember phone blocks from a few years ago was a, a public service project, kind of a design in the open. And it saw about 380 million impressions globally, which is significant. And that was one tiny little four-person design studio that went on to have influence with uh, Google, Fairphone, et cetera. These all became real products. And they didn't necessarily become market worthy because it wasn't super profitable for these companies, but they did not give up at all. Um, that design studio was called One Army. Their domain is called onearmy.earth. They're based in the EU. And their next product was much in the same way of a vein of Oceanworks was called Precious Plastic. And that was how can we take localized plastic resources, how can we aid recycling, and how can we make more and more businesses, more economic opportunity, and more education in the process. And they open sourced every element of the way from collection to the machines, to recycle, um, to extrusion and injection molding for products, and an e-commerce bazaar that actually enables, enables people to sell these same products that are created around the world. Um, preciousplastic.com, phenomenal enterprise, and it's a great example of scalable, noted entrepreneurship that I wanna you know, find ways to do elsewhere in the world for other products. Um, Bringing it down to, to earth and land and, and the New Zealand ecosystem, with agricultural plastics, whether that is um, silage tarps or food containers that have some sort of organic waste contamination, it's challenging to recycle them oftentimes because of those contaminants. And it does not make economic sense to wash them and clean them necessarily. Uh, several manufacturers around the world, including Future Post in New Zealand, are turning waste milk cartons and waste silage tarps into agricultural posts. And as regenerative agriculture expands and more and more grazing is conducted consciously, you have less set stocking and more frequently moving livestock populations, which requires more fence. And conventional treated wood posts oftentimes use uh, CCA or ACQ uh, uh, copper arsenate and, and other heavy metals, which are the exact things you don't want to have leach into the food that you're eating. So if you're in a vineyard or a grazing operation, you don't want to have copper and arsenate in you know, what you're eating. So these plastic posts are organic certified, they're rot resistant, and they're a phenomenal use of resources, in my opinion. Uh, this gentleman is in Alberta, Canada. He created his own in injection molding and extrusion facility to reuse agricultural plastics. But because the heat loads that you require for injection molding and extrusion, he's actually operating this using uh, shredded up pallets. He's reusing local bio biomass for the plastic formation process, which is pretty exceptional and kind of speaks to my farm hack geekery that I, I just appreciate it a lot. And it's another example of a scalable system that can be done anywhere and everywhere on planet Earth. <clears throat> um, back to this element of past, future, present, past, present, future, and what we can do to create a new regenerative world. Uh, the ethic that I'm seeing a lot of right now is a fixation on carbon emissions. And we sometimes wonder where those necessarily come from and how we're writing the ship. And you can look at charts of them. You know, Some of them come from uh, industrial emissions with uh, concrete manufacture and steel manufacture. Some of them come from automobiles and some of them come from tillage-based agriculture and oxidizing soil carbon. And one of the biggest examples we have of recreating and sequestering carbon on planet Earth is engaging in, in regenerative agriculture. So I wanna talk about soil-borne solutions moving forward. Um, again, uh, in my university days, I saw animal agriculture be really vilified for its supposed uh, climate emissions, which I don't think is wholly accurate, given that the alternatives also emit carbon and or more with tillage-based soil practices. And even in a no-till environment, you're then choosing to either 
engage with herbicide use, which is still hydrocarbon sourced and still kills ecosystems. Or alternatively, you're burning hydrocarbons in you know, a propane burned natural gas weeding environment, which is again, the exact same thing of carbon emissions. So this either or uh, conversation you know, is not wholly factual. And I think we were gonna really rely on animal-based agriculture in grazing environments for sequestering carbon moving forward. And New Zealand is one of the best examples of well done ruminant grazing on planet earth. And I'm excited to be able to showcase that and hopefully contribute my skills to building that ecosystem. Um, what I would call agile grazing systems are how do you move animals often with minimal browse that is taking no more than 30 to 50% of vegetation off of the plant before moving on to the next paddock. And in conventional set stocking environments, you know, you're putting livestock in a fence and you're forgetting about them for six months or a year or two years until they're fat. And in agile grazing, you're moving them often to maximize your forage yield, uh, minimize impact on the soil and maximize uh, carbon sequestration in the soil. And this actually shows a big opportunity for applying tech, uh, whether that's software or appropriate tech or um, visualization technologies with, with drones and mapping and, and satellites, et cetera. And we're seeing a lot of you know, money being made in this industry right now. And I wanna showcase some of those examples. Uh, 10 years ago, when I was really getting into quickly moving animals, all of the technology that we were using was coming from New Zealand. Um, brands like Gallagher and Kiwi Tech and Stafix, they're basically almost all owned by the Gallagher Group now, which is based in New Zealand that has a more or less monopoly of innovation on agile grazing technology on planet Earth, which is incredible and not it's not given enough fanfare. Uh, and I'm excited that through this involvement with EHF that it might see even more tech being applied to it. Uh, and then also worth mentioning Upco, who I've been a fan of for six years now, I guess, and still wanting <laughs> a two by two. Um, those tools being deployed globally for agile grazing are gonna be great. Uh, another theme for regenerative agriculture is, is the idea of capital redirection. Um, and I don't know Mike's cohort, maybe we can get a shout out, uh, Paula and Michelle. Um, cohort five, remember I think. Who? Five, yeah. Yeah. Um, conventional ag agricultural lenders shy away from anything perceived to be regenerative agriculture, at least in the US anyway, um, because it's hard to explain. There's more variables. And even though if it's de-risked from a perennial perspective of having more species diversity, on a spreadsheet, whenever you have more variables, it looks more risky to the analyst. And I think that we need to see more and more capital being deployed towards regenerative agriculture. And we need to get more innovative about ways that that's being done. And these are just some great examples of it, whether it's crowdfunding for land purchases or equipment, you know, asset purchases, or finding philanthropic or patient capital uh, that can be deployed towards regenerative ag. And that's going to be tech. Tech is going to make this happen, whether it's socially, operatively, uh, tech is going to do it. Another theme that New Zealand has strength in and great opportunities for growth in is remote and real-time stock management. Um, whether that is virtual fencing technology, that you know, imagine a, a collar being worn around an animal with an audible or a, a shock electrode, where if they get outside of a GPS-enabled virtual boundary, they're told, hey, you should turn around. And as incremental marginal costs come down on these products, you're going to see more and more of that around the world. Um, Real-time thermographics with um, different remote sensing technologies, infrared or otherwise, um, handheld, UAV-based, or even satellite-based. Animal health can be uh, monitored in real time. And if you have a sick animal, the first thing is their body temperature is going to raise. So if you can automatically via a steward interface or via AI, identify which animals are having health concerns, you can immediately address that uh, efficiently, economically, and save the health of your herd. Um, and then other things, you know, stock management, et cetera, um, are gonna be great to, to do this. 
Uh, Rokos, based in Auckland, is, is I feel like it's an investment I missed in the last year. I spoke with them early spring. I was enamored with what they were up to. And they were acquired by the end of the year. They were, I think they were acquired in August or September of this year. And Drone Deploy bought them, which is a US-based, previously UAV dominant um, technology company. Rokos has developed a platform for consciously and efficiently and easily managing fleets, diverse fleets of robots uh, UGVs, unmanned ground vehicles, and UAVs, unmanned aerial vehicles, uh, in addition to conventional rovers. And you're seeing uh, a Boston Dynamics dog here, which you see a lot of those around the world. Um, they developed a platform for the every person, the common non-tech operator, to be able to manage these fleets. And it's going to continue to crush, and it's a big growth opportunity, not only for them, but for other operators um, producing similar products. Um, movement pathways are important in, especially in agricultural environments when you're doing management, whether that is uh, moving fence posts or mowing accurately and repeatedly uh, in environments like orchards or vineyards. How can you mow the understory of a vineyard, not nick tree trunks and plant stems and do it autonomously uh, without human intervention? And unmanned ground vehicles in these environments are gonna be a huge growth environment in the next 10 years. And whoever manages this best as a platform is gonna be like the Bloomberg terminal moving into the future. It's gonna be a layer of management with huge market share. And from what I've seen of Rokos, they're, they're the leaders so far. Uh, another element, that I have experience with and that I see a lot of growth in the New Zealand ecosystem is dynamic data in horticulture and digital twinning. And that occurs in, in two ways predominantly. One is um, getting good visual spatial understanding of what a uh, production environment's doing. So how can you measure fruit yield or bacterial wilt in a kiwi orchard? How can you monitor a vineyard? How do you determine what the crop is looking like? Uh, in an apple orchard, you need to thin the crop. Is your, is your fruit load too heavy? Is that gonna impact you know, size of fruit and grading down the road? And that data collected using UGVs predominantly is huge for making production management decisions. And on the other side of that is digital twinning, meaning mimicking an individual fruit or a case of fruit with sensors so that through the logistics pipeline from field to table, you're able to monitor in real time what's happening there. Mm -hmm. So things like ethylene gas in fruit crops determine how ripe that product is. Um, temperature monitoring. Do, is it in a reefer truck or a container that ran out of fuel or had a, a systems failure? Well, if you have a container of fruit going from New Zealand to the US and you know it's gonna spoil before it gets there, be able to uh, adjust your logistics accordingly. And it's, it's a big deal and it's gonna be a major growth environment moving forward. In New Zealand, because it is so good at agricultural production and it exports so much of its crop through you know, reasonably long supply chains, it's gonna become a leader or could become a leader in this, in this space. Grant, I'm just conscious we've only got 10 minutes left. Should we, and we've got, Harv's got a question there. How about we move into some questions? Oh, sure. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm going slow. Yeah, go for it. Ask away, Hav. Grant, thanks for this. Look, I, um, I'm interested in how, how does New Zealand position itself from, at the moment we produce food as calories to sell, how do we position from selling food as a healthy, um, as a health-based product? Right, so it's it's. Um, I've worked in ag for thirty years, been involved for forty five years, and it's still predominantly very very traditional. So I'm working on another number of projects at the moment that are producing lamb, for instance, that will stop cognitive uh, decline as you get older. Um, but it's very very hard to position a niche product like that in the New Zealand ecosystem where it is predominantly still 
around commodity. Are you talking about for domestic marketing? No, international. Or international. Is my, my present slide still showing? Yep. The idea of nutritional provenance is emerging. If you think about um, French wines or French cheeses and, and local terroir and, and brand awareness because of where it's grown and the flavor profile it might impart. Um, the idea of nutritional provenance is expounding upon the value of that food stuff based upon what it, where it's grown and what its actual nutritional value is. In the US, um, we have kind of blanket uh, nutritional analysis for a commodity and it's assumed that that same piece of broccoli it has the same nutritional qualities, whatever it is. And that's fundamentally not true. And I think that via tissue testing or via soil testing or both in a lot basis, you're able to assign value add for that crop based upon its nutritional analysis. And this, I think that speaks directly to your question as one idea of, of achieving that value. Um, Simple ideas like unpackaged QR codes that have video tutorials or expound on, um, you know, that education for an individual food product uh, are also opportunities. I think um, that's my thoughts. I'd love to hear others. There, there, look, there's massive opportunities, and particularly in the sheep sector, where I don't know why with lamb, but they have a, a remarkable diverse gene pool, and um, I've been involved in one project where we found the gene marker for omega lamb. So producing lamb that had the same omega levels as a fatty fish, right? Mm -hmm. However, it's still really bloody hard to extract value out of a market where the whole system in New Zealand is predominantly devoted to commodity, right? And now at the moment, I'm looking at another uh, gene program based on identifying and speeding up selection based on nutritional values that will literally, if you eat lamb once a week, will decrease cognitive decline as you get older. And I'm just really interested and but frustrated in New Zealand that we do not seem to have an ecosystem that swarms over this stuff. We still have a very clunky system devoted to commodities it sounds like a marketing opportunity and 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 value to be extracted and harnessed um absolutely is yeah the 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 paleo movement in the u.s paleolithic diet movement in the u.s is is more conscious of omega-3 to omega-6 ratios and um oddly enough the majority of the the true grass-fed beef that's sold in the US is sourced from Australia. Um, and that marketing is being done here um, through those movements, through a kind of a pre-educated consumer. Um, I don't know how much genetics of individual animals uh, affects the omega ratios more than the, the forage that they're eating. But if that can be done with genetics, that's, that's huge as well. It's a combination. Yeah, combination. Mm. I'm just trying to think what the question is. I just I get frustrated with our with the system that we've got to go through the same freezing works uh, that it's very hard to keep control of a product. Hmm. Well, maybe you should buy a few hundred thousand pounds of lamb and develop your own marketing and market it into into the world. It sounds like an opportunity. Hmm. Any other questions at this at this juncture? I know I'm getting hoarse and being slower than I'd like to be. I have perhaps 15 slides left. I do know that um, Cheryl had offered to introduce you to um, the R&D director at uh, Gala, at Caliga Group at some point. So she's left, put her email address in there. So that's good for you. She has to jump. Cool. Um, yeah, there's about five minutes left, but Paula has offered that she can stay on if anyone still wants to ask any more questions. 
But if you want to go through your last 15 slides, if you just want to check if there's no more questions, what they are. I'm happy to sure. stay, Grant, and I'm also happy to hear to those about those okay. slides. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll also, soldier on. Um, yeah, Carl says yes. <laughs> cool. I'll, I'll soldier on. Um, Real-time food labeling is a, another opportunity for, for marketing. Um, some Swiss researchers identified carbon nanotubes um, that could effectively be tied to chroma indicators. So rather than have an arbitrary spoilage date on a package of food, you know, 30 days from X, it can be tied to the true oxidative sense inside that package. So you could have you can reduce you know food waste for one, but also increase consumer trust that when they take home a package of meat or a gallon of milk, uh, it's truly going to be fresh and not just spoiled early or, or affected otherwise. Marketing opportunity. Uh, what I would call lemonade businesses, uh, finding ecological dysregulation and making a, you know, finding golden fleece in it. Uh, around the world, we're seeing in, in Hawaii, we're seeing uh, feral deer being marketed as high omega-3, uh, great, you know, pasture-raised meat. Um, we're seeing invasive uh, autumn olive trees marketing their fruit as having 40 times the lycopene of the, the best produced organic tomato. In Miami, in Southern Florida in the US and in Central America, you're seeing a, a wild feral iguana being marketed as a delicacy. Um, <laughs> the bottom right is kind of my, my joke, but it's not, it should be considered as the idea of cane toads as a foodstuff. If you think about Northeast Australia and the cane toads going amok, that's a great uh, free protein source in my opinion. And really it's just a matter of, can you convince the consumer and uh, any regulatory body to allow it. And in many places where it's done, it, it's happening successfully. Uh, responsible aquaculture, in my opinion, is a major growth environment, especially in a coastal environment like, like New Zealand. Uh, keyword responsible. Um, on, I've seen aquaculture done right, and I've seen it done very, 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 very wrong. Um, in a lot of offshore fish farms, we're basically making the mistakes of conventional land-based agriculture and exporting them into the ocean, um, you know, feeding corn and soy uh, in, in a high volumes, having genetically modified fish escape to hybridize with wild populations, poisoning predation, you know, a, a, an eagle uh, overhead of a fixed pen and killing them. Um, yet there's also ways to do it well. Um, and I think that identifying well done aquaculture and promoting well done aquaculture is a major growth opportunity in New Zealand and around the world. Um, my interest and deepest skill depth is around the idea of precision agroforestry, that is conscious melding of forestry and agriculture done ideally with multi-band precision GPS, um, both for accurately tracking yields, but also long-term digital twinning and data collection. Um, the idea of agroforestry is becoming more and more popular because of it's producing edible food crops, it's improving conventional agricultural yields and other, and other field crops and grazing operations. In hot environments, having simple things like shade every 600 feet improves yield and production of uh, animal-based agriculture. Um, you're seeing more carbon sequestration from those tree crops with deeper root systems, and you're encouraging faster turnover of uh, grasses and, and, and pasture, which is increasing rates of root sloughing, which is actually increasing rates of carbon in soils versus uh, destroying them. Um, this is a colleague of mine, uh, Christopher Anderson is, is a Dane. Um, we're demoing a product that is allowing us to track fungal yields. So this, imagine a, a truffle orchard. We're able to track fungal yields, meaning truffles collected, uh, with centimeter accuracy through multi-band GPS and tracking that over time related to the trees that exist in that orchard. Um, it's getting us multi-layer data sets, but it's also allowing for split testing between different management practices across different orchard blocks, much the way you'd, you'd split test a software product, we can split test management techniques in real time. Uh, 
in general, I'm not a fan of row crop agriculture, even though I'm immersed in it. Um, but if I can convert more soybean acres into agroforestry crops, that is my life's work. Um, this is a system that we've been working on for about the last 10 years. This is like one replicate of the things that I've been doing. Um, on the left, you're seeing a chestnut tree. On the right is a pecan tree. This is obviously a 3D you know, visual graphic, not a real photo. But chestnuts are basically replacing corn as a carbohydrate crop. Um, pecans have the protein and fat profile of soybeans that are replacing that. We're aiding in the carbon sequestration by eliminating the otherwise uh, tillage-based production practices of corn or soy. We're able to graze the alleyways in the meantime. And again, this is the big cool thing is that we're conscious of the fungal populations of the soil and we're actively inoculating for truffles. Uh, a species called Tuber lyonii, which is very similar to the white Italian truffle, is native to North America. We're growing with pecan trees. And uh, Tuber eshtavim, which is like the burgundy truffle, French truffle, black truffle, we're growing with chestnut trees. Um, so I'm really excited about this and, and wanting to scale this up as you know, a major thing around planet Earth. And again, at about year 40 for chestnuts and year 80 for pecans, there's also timber yield. Um, there's well-known stock analysts that think that black walnut trees are the best investments uh, globally, beating out the stock performance of the S&P 500 over the last 50 years. So I'm excited to be able to have biodiverse perennial production systems that also have you know, high-end timber yields you know, as those systems are turned over. And with that, I leave you with a Buckminster Fuller quote that I should have opened with, and that is us in EHF, a group of decision makers and change makers. How will we change the ship of state on planet Earth? And that is by accessing our inner trim tabs and kicking the ship of state. Um, that's, that's our foot and our collective feet right there are being kicked out, creating areas of low pressure, turning around the rudder of the ship of state and making a better world. Um, so with that, I'm totally done with my presentation and Fantastic. any conversation afterwards. Well, you had two questions that you're going to leave everyone with. And I think we could do like a, to those 50 people that registered, I think we could do email them out those two questions. And then you could sort of go pick one of those Slack groups and you could start some kind of sure. combo going. Um, one is along the lines of um, capital sourcing is how do we find more sources and more pools of patient capital for longer term regenerative agriculture projects. Mm. Specifically, the rate of return on an annualized basis, the IRR of regenerative ag is better than conventional ag, but you're looking at five to eight years of negative cash flows to kickstart those systems. Mm. How do we find more sources of capital and de-risk those systems to make it a functional investment? That's one. Uh, and the other is, I love the first six months of a startup. How do we collaborate passively or actively to create a venture studio based in New Zealand to engage with specifically regenerative agriculture? How do we I, you know, ideate and promote yeah. and build effective informed teams to launch more products that can scale globally in regenerative ag from New Zealand. Can you expand on the second question? I don't, I don't, haven't quite grasped it yet. Sure. Um, a, a venture studio, instead of a conventional uh, venture capital firm that invests in other companies, a venture studio um, like Idea Lab, like Bill Gross's enterprise in the 90s and 2000s, is we're going to bring in together entrepreneurs and residents, smart, capable people. Got it have them brainstorm ideas and turn them into effective companies. Got it. Yep. And there's a great source in New Zealand already for that now. So we've got our first carbon positive farm in, registered in down in a place called Lake Hawea Station. It would be an ideal place to base that from. High profile, lots of smart kids being attracted to it would be perfect for that grant. Yeah. Yep. And yep. It, I think it, it does take it takes a land base to actually 
prototype and deploy this stuff, you know, nearby. And it, it probably takes an engineering or an ag school nearby as well. Yep. Yep. It's cool. not near nearby. It's an hour's flight away. But uh, um, I think that's a wonderful idea. Mm. Awesome. I think we 